morning, everybody. Um, I'm Karen Holloway, and I work for The Mill, which is a locally owned and operated ag retail business. We sell feed, seed, fertilizer, pet supplies, lawn and garden, a whole host of things. Um, but this morning, we're going to be chatting more about chickens. Um, and I guess before we get started, um, let's go ahead and introduce uh, each of you who are involved in our video this morning. Twain, let's start with you. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Twain Lockhart. Uh, I've been raising chickens for over 50 years. I've been with Neutrina for 15, and I've been in the uh, feed business for about 25 years. Holly. Hi, I'm Holly Callahan Kosmala. I'm a farm girl. I grew up a 4 -er. I grew up on a horse farm. I've been keeping chickens for over 20 years, and I also keep wool sheep. I am the history and research part of the Coffee with the Chicken Ladies podcast team. Okay, and Chrissy. Hey, everybody. I'm Chrissy DiCarlo. I am the other half of Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, the podcast team. I am a retired veterinary technician trauma nurse from an urban Baltimore hospital. And I've had chickens for over 10 years, and we have enjoyed being chicken educators for over four years with the podcast itself. Great. I think we have uh, certainly a, a good variety of experience, uh, plenty of enthusiasm, and plenty of chicken topics that we can talk about this morning. Um, so I have some questions that maybe have come from customers or uh, just questions that I think kind of uh, hit home in terms of the time of year that we're in uh, for those of you that are raising chickens. So I guess one of the things that we want to talk about, um, there are plenty of folks that bought um, baby chicks back in the springtime. Um, so those chicks are now uh, growing and reaching uh, the productive stage, pullets coming into egg production now. Um, so that's uh, one of the things we probably have going on in the coop. So we wanted to just touch a little bit on kind of what to expect and how we handle uh, that situation in terms of, you know, how we how we may want to feed them um, and, and what we want to be doing along those lines. Twain, let's start out with you on that one. Well, um, one of the, the big mistakes I see new, new chicken owners make is they wait till they see the first egg to switch them over to a layer feed. And it's not an end of the world mistake, although it, it can be a real pain in the butt. And, I, and I'll tell you why. Chicken, the starter feed has virtually no calcium in it. You need to pump up the calcium in Betty's system. To me, all laying hens are named Betty. Everybody's got a Betty. So you need to pump up that calcium in Betty's system at about 16 weeks. So you switch to layer feed at about 16 weeks. At that time, you also supply Betty with oyster shell free choice, meaning a separate dish. If she needs it, she eats it. If she doesn't need it, she just leaves it to build up the calcium in her system. And the reason this is so important, if Betty isn't getting enough calcium in her diet, if you wait till you see that first egg, you may create a, or she may create a very brittle eggshell. And once that breaks, your girls discover what's inside that egg. And then you end up with what we call an egg eater. In my house, an egg eater is a crock pot offense. They go to live in the country or a freezer camp or whatever you wanna say. The reason why, and I know that sounds harsh, but it is a very nasty habit to break. It is so much easier to prevent that from ever happening. So that is my take on the nutrition. She will be on that layer feed for the rest of her life. You can give her treats and stuff, but you're done with starter feed at about 16 weeks. I want to say something with that because, and just add on to what you're saying health wise. The first thing that really works well with that program of changing at 16 weeks is that's when you're going to be integrating small chickens into the flock with the larger, older chickens who are already on the layer feed. So a lot of times people are very confused about what I feed with in conjunction with the babies are eating this, the big girls are eating this. This really clears up that confusion. You're going to eat. They're all going to eat the layer food when the integration is happening. So there's no misconception of what food here and there. There Now, the other thing is health problems. If you start it too late, one of which is a prolapse and other is soft eggs on top of egg eating, the health issues. If there's not enough calcium, 
those eggshells can be soft and those those are much harder to lay than a hard eggshell, which can cause young chickens to have a prolapse. And a prolapse is when it, everything kind of sticks out and it's not supposed to. So then you'll have to treat that along with getting them caught up on the on the calcium. Yeah, one of my most common questions is what predator eats a chicken, you know, southbound going, going northbound eat, and they eat just the rear end. Now, well, guys, that wasn't a predator. That was their buddies. You had a prolapse, and before you found her, her buddies found her, and they all start picking at that. And if it starts to bleed or hemorrhage, it's over. She's done. They they kind of, they're almost like piranha, man. They really go after that. So you really want to avoid the prolapse. Good point. Right. One of my favorite tips for this time of year. So you're if you're integrating new pullets into an older flock, a lot of your older girls are molting, so they're not laying as often. <clears throat> and I've found over the years that putting some false eggs in the nest boxes is really helpful to the young ones. They don't know what's going on at first. And seeing the eggs in a box, there's sort of a biological imperative there to lay eggs in a clutch. So a few false eggs really helps them. Good, great points, great points. Um, another question that um, kind of tying into the feed side of things and, and making sure that we're feeding them properly, getting them enough nutrients. Sometimes we'll get folks that are um, interested maybe in, it, it's the time of year when we're cleaning out our garden and we have plants and veggies and so forth that maybe we're not going to use. Um, what can we use them to feed our chickens? Uh, if so, which ones can we use? What should we steer against? And how do we take this into account in terms of um, the rest of the feeding program? Yeah, you, you can certainly feed them vegetables. In fact, what I like to do is in the fall, having your chickens, okay, and this is a visual, health in the garden is not necessarily a good thing especially before you have harvested because they will help themselves. Uh, but after you've harvested, letting the chickens go in and dig things up, they're going to dig up a lot of grubs and bugs and things are going to hatch next spring. So you will see a significant reduction in your garden pests the following spring. So most vegetables are safe. I, I know avocado peels are supposed to be a big no-no, potato peels, anything that'll mold is a bad idea. And, and people think that chickens are feathered garbage cans. And in a way they kind of are, but they you, they shouldn't have moldy things. That can make them sick. Not even sick enough that you might even notice, but it can affect their health, might affect their laying. So it needs to be relatively fresh produce. So it, it, I'll let you guys continue with that. I just want to add on to it because Twain has such really good points and even go to next step medically. When they're in the garden, they want to be, you want them to take the small bite sized pieces that they need to take. The reason why you want to stay away from peels, anything extra long, anything that way is because that can become a trap in their crop. And their crop is their external stomach. And that's where they put all the food to slowly digest as they need it. And if they have things that are very fibrous, or very long strips of things, that can cause some problems in the crop. It can cause different infections. It can cause an impaction. So just being very careful in what you give them. And Holly, I'll let you go along with what we should be giving them out of the garden. Generally, you're safest if you're feeding them something whole, where they can take small bites, or if you've chopped things finely. Because Big, long, fibrous things, like Chrissy said, can really stick in the crop. The other thing, and this isn't something that's commonly known, we just learned this ourselves a few years back, spinach. You only want to feed spinach in small amounts because spinach is very high in oxalic acid, which can be very damaging to the kidneys. Wow, I did not know that. I learned something every time I, I have a, right. a meeting with you too. So that is awesome. So I, the I always get excited. So yeah. The the big substitute is kale. Kale is right. excellent. Kale right. gives them lots of vitamin C. It's one of the highest things in vitamin C out there. So it helps their immune system. And it's, you know, they take the bites that they want, or you can cut it up. You can cut it off the stalks. With the stalks, hopefully they stay away. They're a little hard and fibrous and hard to digest. But yeah, that's the great substitute is kale for spinach. So, you know. And this time of year, you can give them whole pumpkins. It's nice to like cut a nick and get them started, but they will take a pumpkin right down to nothing and they love it yeah there, there's a, a big controversy on pumpkin seeds i've heard this since i was a kid that pumpkin seeds will naturally help deworm a chicken 
I don't have any clinical proof that it will or will not, but I will say they do like them. So there's some research on this actually. Um, okay. It's in the unfortunately it's not complete. So and generally this is not research that's done in the U.S. So in I believe in Europe, maybe Africa, they discovered that there is a chemical naturally occurring in the pumpkin seed. The problem is no one knows the best way to deliver it or how much is necessary. So we always tell listeners, go ahead and do it. It's not going to hurt mm -hmm. anything. But mm -hmm. if your chicken has a worm load, please don't rely on pumpkin seeds at this point. The yeah, other thing that we found out is that the pumpkin seeds act mechanically. Right. So they're very, very fibrous and they can help break off the worms in the intestines and the fiber can help push the worms out. Now, if you have a really strong worm load, that's not going to take care yeah. of the problem. Like Holly Ann said, you have to use a pharmaceutical dewormer. Okay. Um, let's see. So a few minutes ago, we did touch on another um, situation that may start to occur this time of year, the whole the molt situation. So let's go, get into detail a little bit more on that, because I know with especially with the newbies to chickens, perhaps the first time this happens can be a little traumatizing to the humans that own the chickens. Um, but let's uh, kind of touch on that and uh, give our listeners a little bit more detail. Well, th this creates a lot of confusion because most newbies assume they're going to see the entire life cycle of a chicken in a year. And that that's not going to happen. OK, it really takes two years. OK, <clears throat> and the reason why is your birds will molt and that is where they naturally drop. I don't know what a third of their feathers, half their feathers. It depends on the bird. It's an individual process. And this will <clears throat> this will happen at 15 to 18 months of age, usually late summer, early fall. They will drop these feathers while they're molting. They stop laying. Now, this created a whole lot of controversy a couple of years ago. Oh, yes. Social media. Oh, my God. <laughs> the world was ending. Uh, all these political figures. You could always tell which side somebody leaned by which political figure was paying us, the feed companies, to put additives in the feed to make them stop laying. <laughs> and by the way, my chicken's feathers fell out, too. OK, this is not what's going on. All right. This is natural. So. I always tell people, the, you know, your first year pullets generally will lay through the winter without artificial lighting. If they're after that, you need to put artificial lighting on them. They need about 16 hours a day. That's a whole nother topic. We could do a whole seminar on artificial lighting. My solution, if you want to get eggs all year round, I let my girls have the winter off. It's not right or wrong. I just, we don't light them in the winter. We just add new pullets. So the answer to all of life's questions is to get more chickens. So we add chickens to the flock every spring. So that's my take on that. So molting, I'm going to jump in and expand on Twain again. Molting is a natural process that the chicken goes through in which the feathers get worn throughout the year. So when you see the feathers falling out, you may notice one side of the feather is a little more worn down than the other because the feathers protect their actual body from elements like rain, water. They keep them dry and they need to be replenished and changed. And they stop laying because it takes all the calcium and protein they have in their body to build new feathers so that kind of gets changed now twain did not mention that neutrina has a food mm -hmm. called feather fixer that is amazing to use during this time of the year it's especially made for chickens who are molting it has it has herbs it has higher protein everything that you need for these chickens to grow their feathers as quickly as possible it's really painful they're called pin feathers because everyone comes through the skin like a pin. So they sometimes need support. They need extra protein. They need extra love. You have to watch and make sure they're eating well. It's a time of the year when they can get sick more easily. So pay close attention to them. You may need to intervene at some time. Yeah, I tell people during molting, just keep an eye on your chickens. Sometimes they stop eating and you might need to tempt them a bit. <clears throat> I do like Chrissy. My birds get feather fixer anytime molting starts. And that that's like across the board. Roosters, hens, everyone gets feather fixer. But often you'll hear that chickens don't need fat in their diet, which is incorrect because chickens need a lot. They need a lot of vitamins, some of which are fat soluble. So one of my favorite things, even though they're all on feather fixer, I mean they really need a lot of nutrition. So I will slip them some suet balls or suet cakes that you can get in the wild bird section. 
And it really goes a long way to helping them meet all of their nutritional needs during this very stressful time. The other thing I'm just going to throw it out is occasionally Betty may decide to molt at odd times. Okay. Yeah. This can be brought on by stress. It can be brought on by a lot of things and these stress factors. I mean, it's not like Betty can't pay her bills or something. Think of Betty being the top or the bottom of the pecking order and Betty's getting picked on, or maybe Betty's really sexy and the rooster won't leave her alone. Or, you know, there can be any number of things that can stress Betty out. Or and she went broody. If she yes. goes broody, there's a so, brood molt usually after um, they come out of a brood. Changing the lighting in your coop can cause, I had a case one time where a guy's birds, all the feathers dropped out. Of course, they blame the feed. And I'm looking at his coop and I said, why is this van parked here? And he said, well, my son did that. And it was parked right in front of the window. And I said, how long has this been here? And he told me and it was about the same time the birds molted at this odd, you know, they molted in like February. And I said, dude, you just blocked all the light out of your chickens. And as soon as they moved the van, it took a while, but it corrected itself. Yeah, chickens are, are we all are, but chickens very much are, are, attuned to circadian rhythms so yeah. day length light all of those things really do matter and the re the reason you don't see a big molt the first year is because as babies they're replacing their feathers almost constantly they're molting that whole first year it's just a very the slow molt exactly the second year tends to be the most catastrophic molt that you see and then every year they're going to molt again but it's not going to be in my experiences that second year you have like little naked porcupine chickens it can be really bad. And, and some chickens molt more than others, I feel like. Oh, yeah. there's nothing like seeing a naked neck molt. Oh, my <laughs> God. My neighbors almost turned me into the animal control. They thought I was doing something to them. They're so horrible looking. Well, were you wearing those glasses you had on earlier? Because that might have been why. <laughs> That's how I got out of the ticket. I just put those those sexy glasses on and the animal control lady left me on. <laughs> You'll probably edit that out. <laughs> I think it should stay in. We do a lot of editing when we have Twain on the show. Yeah, I can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Um, let's see. How about, uh, since we've touched on this briefly, but as we're coming into the winter months, um, let's talk a bit about uh, winterizing the coop, things we need to think about in the colder weather. Um, I know last winter in particular, we, we did hit a pretty cold spell. Maybe we've had some fairly mild winters within our area recently, but uh, what do we need to be thinking about as far as winterizing the coop and taking care of the chickens throughout the winter months? I like to winterize the chickens. Uh, I like to look at them in the fall. It's a great time to check them for bugs. The bugs, uh, the external parasites, they're not smart, but instinctively they know they need to get on a warm body or they're not going to survive. So this is a good time to check your birds for parasites. See if maybe Betty's real skinny. We don't know why Betty was real skinny, but if she's real skinny going into winter, Betty may not survive. So good time to winterize the chickens themselves. As far as the coop, I'll I'll hand that off to Chrissy and Holly. So we, we're going to be having an episode coming out talking about fall prep and the things that we normally do. And there's a lot of maintenance that goes into coop and run, checking for drafts, pulling out the panel heaters that you want to have on hand, just in case you have these chickens with big combs and waddles. We or believe that tiny bantams or tiny chickens, yeah. putting the fans away. It's a, something that we do. We switch them off. Looking at your clasps, your clasps on your run, on your coop, making sure everything is secure for the winter. And something I do is I do wrap most of my run in a greenhouse tarp, uh, both of them throughout the winter to create a wind block. And it I do the greenhouse tarps because they let all the light in and the heat through it, but they stop the wind. That's a nice solution. I've never thought of that. That That's great. Yeah. I don't do the entire thing. I leave the front open so they can get air, you know, ventilation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, so, that's important that they get that ventilation. Uh, it supposedly, I now I've heard pro and con that it helps reduce frostbite. If you're too sealed in, that when they respirate, it puts moisture in the air and can cause frostbite. And then I've heard that's kind of been debunked. So it has, in fact, because what you're talking about there is a very mild frostbite. 
where the breath kind of crystallizes and the ice would settle on the comb or waddles. And it's not going to make a really deep frostbite. Really deep frostbite occurs because of cold temperatures. And that's it. Literally, the liquid, the liquid or fluid in the chicken skin freezes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's very deep. It's very damaging. It can be extraordinarily painful. The best thing you can do is have ventilation because you don't want moisture and ammonia build up in your mm -hmm. coop because then you get mold and you get, you know, respiratory problems. But if it's going to be zero degrees and your chickens are used to say nothing below 25 degrees and they're again, big combs and waddles, things like uh, leghorns, especially leghorn roos with those mm -hmm. massive things. And illusions, and anything. Illusions, tiny birds, any of the birds that are Mediterranean breeds, elderly birds, all of them, once upon a time, you probably you probably would have lost a lot of them during a super cold winter. Mm -hmm. But now there's very safe technology, zero clearance panel heaters. They don't make your coop hot. There's no, accl there's no acclimation issue, but it might take your coop up to say 28 degrees. And that's enough to ward off very deep frostbite. It's been an invaluable tool. I can't say enough good about them. They're radiant heat. So they do get warm, but they, even if a bird touches them, it's not warm enough well, to do anything. It's My not a fire hazard is the, is the big one. The, those brooding lamps that we brood baby chicks with, guys, those were never designed to hang in your coop. You're always going to have one rotten chicken that's going to decide to perch on that thing and get that right. down in your bedding. Every year we read about it somewhere, somebody's coat burns down. So yeah, those brooding lamps were not designed to keep your chickens warm in the winter. And the paddle heaters for most healthy chickens or big chickens, they're not going to need those heaters if in the mid-Atlantic more than like maybe half a dozen times in a winter. Yeah. <clears throat> Unless again, you have elderly chickens or tiny chickens. But my tiny Nankin Bantams, are less than two pounds, they actually, the hens will perch on the top of the heater. They love it that much. The other it's, thing is make sure you have pop-up cages and other things that in case there's a disaster, a blizzard, you have a place to move your chickens, say into a basement, a garage. So it's easier to take care of them during these really bad weather times in the winter with the panel eaters. You can even use them in your house. It's perfect. They work really well. Nothing metal that they can perch on, guys. When you're setting up your coop, right. you don't want anything metal because now they're only wood and plastic, uh, preferably wood. You don't want them perching on something metal. They'll, they'll frostbite their toes or freeze their toes. Oh, yeah, that would be awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Okay, well, certainly a great wealth of knowledge and experience in the group here. Um, before we end, I wanted to just mention a couple of things, uh, and maybe we'll let Twain go into a little bit more detail, but we mentioned the feather fixer from Neutrina. Um, and we also have a brand new nature wise product from Neutrina. Um, Twain, do you want to go into the details on that one? On the harvest blend? Yes. Yes. Harvest blend is a brand new product for us. Now I'm going to say the concept is is not really new. The whole grain mix has been out there for when I was a little kid, but they were feeding that to showbirds. We'll call them showbirds. Uh, let's just call them what they are. They're feeding that primarily to gamecocks and showbirds and pigeons. And it's very old school. Now, the problem with feeding that to laying hens is they may not eat it all. They may not eat everything they need. And the most important thing they need in that mix is the pellet. So we developed basically this whole grain mix with the pellet that the girls will eat. And we did that by putting the essential oils in it and a few other little super secret, top secret, high clearance tricks that Mark came up with. They eat it all now. If you feed the Gamecock mix to a Gamecock, he's in a cage by himself or a showbird, they always keep those birds a little bit hungry. So they will consume every particle, every bite. So now it's a complete diet. If your girls sort that feed, it's not a complete diet. So they will eat everything in the harvest blend. Oh my God, my girls go crazy for it and they don't leave anything. The other thing that happens when they leave part of the diet is when they go to bed at night, it's laying on the floor. If you leave feed on the floor at night, you're going to bring un uninvited guests in, and by the way, of rats or mice, and you don't want those. So you want them to clean everything up at night or during the day, so they don't leave anything on the ground at night. So it is an 18% protein. 
Uh, it's not quite as shiny as some of the Gamecock mixes. We designed this so the girls like it. The girls don't care if it's shiny. Uh, it's a little bit shiny, but it's not super shiny. And every regional mill has a Gamecock mix. It tends to be very shiny and pretty. But, you know, if you keep your birds hungry, they'll eat it. But my girls are very fat and well-fed. Um, and if they don't really like it, they're going to leave part of it. So it has the essential oils. It has the cream probiotics. It's an 18% protein. It is a complete diet. So you can feed it as a treat or a complete diet. So now we can, of, va we can vouch. Uh, I, I, in a nutshell, it's they like it like scratch. So think of Twinkies that are good for you. That's kind of how that's my my thought process. There is we've developed a Twinkie that the girls like and it's good for them. Now we so. can vouch for it because we were part of the secret testing group that our flocks did get it over the summer for two weeks, and they devoured it. And mine are not used to that feed at all. And when it was gone, they were sad. Very yes, sad. that's a, that's how you know they really like it. It's when you go back to like the regular pellets, they look at you like, hey, what's this? What's this crap? Where's <laughs> our really harvest blend? Happy. They were yeah. not happy when it was gone. <laughs> no, and, and I I'm, mixed mine. I mixed mine I did with too. half regular Neutrina pellets, you know, regular mm -hmm. layer pellets, and then half of the harvest blend. And they ate every single bit of it, every bit. And I mixed I mine this... with my crumble and they mix, they ate everything, yeah. you know, so. The first time I gave it to them, I noticed a little hesitation. They're like, what's this? But once they got rolling, man, they went crazy for it. I did notice a little hiccup in my egg production between like the second and third day. But anytime you change a diet drastically, that happens. But by the, by the third day, fourth day, they were right back to normal again. And they were laying just as much as they were on the regular laying pellets. So. Now, the rule in the veterinary world is if you're changing any animal's food, their digestive tract works way different than ours. Ours is way more complex and we can handle spicy in the morning and oatmeal yeah. at night. And it really doesn't matter. Where animals come in, they do get a disruption if you change things. So the best thing to do, which we would always recommend in the animal hospitals, is to mix half and half for the first two to three days. Then you switch to 75 new, 25 old. And then after that, you go everything. And you give their system about a week or two to get used to the new food. So buy the bag when you still have about two weeks left of the old food, mix it in and let them get used to it. And hopefully that can make a smooth transition into this new food. I mixed it to give them the best of both worlds, and they loved it. That's a great I call. Put... I just did it cold turkey because I figured there was going to be a bunch of people that do it cold turkey just to see what happened. Yeah. So. Yeah. I want to do a real quick pl plug for Feather Fixer because it is one of my favorite foods out there. It is <clears throat> designed for molting, and Twain knows a whole heck of a lot about that because he was involved in it. And... You can actually feed it year round if you want to with the eighteen percent and all the fantastic chelated minerals in there. It's a it's a really amazing food. Yeah, the show world they love it in the show world. You go to any poultry show and you see bags of feather fixer all over the place. So right, we've been fielding questions on our end about feather fixer and how does it how does it do with egg laying? It's perfect. Yeah, nothing's going to stop with the egg laying. It's a yeah. little bit of a push with extra protein. Uh, and that's what they need. They need a little bit more protein during the molt. That's why we say give the feather fixer. And if you're going to do treats, do higher in protein pr treats like field peas, uh, tuna, those Grub. types of things, grubs, soldier fly grubs. Those types of things are higher in protein and calcium. So they will aid in the, the, the goal is to get the feathers to grow in as quick as possible. Yeah, and then back just a, another comment um, on the NatureWise Harvest Blend um, from the human side of things. Uh, we ask the employees in each of our mill locations to open a bag to have it there, um, you know, to to look at and smell. And it smells absolutely fabulous. I know our smell is maybe a little bit more sensitive or a little stronger than what a chicken sense of smell might be. But uh, yeah, from the human standpoint, I think if anybody takes a look at it and takes a smell, it's something that uh, that they'll certainly be inclined to to give a try. Uh, yeah. And then obviously, plenty of have chick chickens so far have tried and certainly enjoyed it. So <laughs> yeah, there's essential oils, and and that is what helps make it so palatable for the girls. Right. So right. And their eyes are way stronger than ours, so they're <laughs> looking like 
it's Mardi Gras. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what am I going to get here? This is amazing. So, yeah, uh, they're looking at it like it's a party explosion. So it's good, good stuff packed. And the protein and all the good stuff is in that pellet. So they're going to eat everything, and it's great stuff. Okay. Well, certainly appreciate the three of you joining us and um, certainly a great conversation. Again, a lot of enthusiasm and experience and knowledge, and uh, we have certainly appreciated it. Anytime. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Certainly. Thank you. Mm -hmm.